Make sure to go and check out all of our latest merch at paddockmerch.com. We've got loads of new designs and even more products come in all the time. With two or more items, you get 20% off using the code PADDOCK20. And if you remember, there's even bigger discounts available. Link is in the description. Jay Mott here from Stretford Paddock. This is the one-on-one interview. And today we're talking to a leading financial football or a football financial expert, Kieran Maguire. We're always being asked about the Glazers, about the finances at Manchester United. And anyone who watches the channel knows I'm no expert, but we've got someone on who is. Kieran, thanks for chatting to us. Cheers, Jay. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, there's always lots of stories through the rounds when it comes to the Glazers and their ownership of Manchester United. And I know you've been speaking about this recently. We saw stories regarding the sale of a lot of shares by the Glazers, just I think it was last week. What can you tell us about that? Does it mean anything in terms of the ownership of the club, in terms of money going into the club at all? What does this recent story regarding the, the sale of these shares mean? Well, what, what we saw last week was... Uh... Kevin and Edward uh, Glazer, they sold nine and a half million shares in United between them. Now, United have got 160 million shares. So it's 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 around about seven or eight percent. And people will say, well, yeah, could that be significant? The big issue at United is there's two types of shares. There's the shares which you can buy and sell on the New York Stock Exchange, and they've got one vote each. Um, so, you know, if, if you're deciding on, you know, the big decisions at the club, uh, so they got one vote each. And then there's also things called the, the, uh, the A shares, which are exclusively owned by the Glazers, and they've got 10 votes each, and there's 120 million of them. So what the Glazers uh, did last week was that they made a fair amount of money for themselves. Yeah, we, we don't know what price in t- exactly but probably in the region of 130 to 140 million quid so so kevin and edward uh, pocketed that money uh, it all goes to them nothing goes to the club itself uh, and whoever's going to be the new owners they they end up with 0.7 percent of manchester united in terms of votes uh, and it's votes which are critical because with the votes you can change the manager you can uh, you can agree to spend more money and, and so on um, so it was it was good news for the Glazers. Make doesn't make it doesn't make any difference whatsoever to uh, the ownership and control of Manchester United as far as as day to day activities are concerned. Just in terms of of the the debt that that United are in and the Glazers have put the club in, is is that getting any better? What's the situation there? Because when just from a layman's sort of, sort of point of view, I look at this and I see shares being sold, money being made. Yet we're still in debt. What's happening with that? Well, um, when, when the Glazers initially acquired United, which was what, yeah, 2005, um, they, they, they borrowed to, to buy the shares at the time and they borrowed on, on the club's assets. Uh, effectively, they, they took out a mortgage to allow them to buy United using United's brand, using all of United's assets. Um, since then, they've they've repaid very little of it. There was a little bit which was repaid in, I think, 2011, 2012. But since then, what they've done is that they've taken out the equivalent of an interest only mortgage. So um, each year, you know, the, the banks pick up somewhere in the region of, you know, sort of 20 million quid. Um, and that gets that gets paid. And that, that's money which, of course, doesn't go to the, the playing budget. Uh, another £22 million goes to the shareholders, so that will be mainly the Glazers. So that there's, there's around about £40 million a year, roughly, which is, which is going out of the club. There's no sign of that debt being repaid. It, it, it's a bit like an interest-only mortgage where um, it will eventually come to a point where you've got to pay it back. But I suspect what will happen is they'll just simply renegotiate the loan for another 10 or 20 years before it has to be repaid. So this is going to continue for a long time, I think, under the Glazer ownership. That sort of brings me to my next question. In terms of the value of the club, is do you see the value of the club changing much over the next few years? And in turn, is that going to affect how the Glazers see the club? Do you see that leading to them selling it at all? Um, the, the Glazers bought Manchester United for around about 700 million in 2005. If they sold it today at 
today's price, you'd get yeah, around about three times that. Um, and, and United share price has taken a hammering uh, since last Tuesday, since the, that share sale was was announced by the Glazers, because they effectively flooded the market um, with with shares. So that that drove down prices. Um, the thing about companies is that if somebody offers you enough money, then um, then you will sell at, at these prices. The Glazers certainly are not in a hurry. Uh, I, I think paradoxically, if Super League had gone ahead um, and the first reaction by the by the markets at Super League was it, it increased the value of United, somebody might have come in. But that's simply because they would have made a lot more money out of the club because you know, they, they didn't have to win matches to to qualify for uh, Super League. You you wouldn't have been able to be held ransom at uh, ransom ransom in Super League for, for players, because I think one of the rules was that you couldn't transfer players from one Super League club to another until his contract expired um, and, and things like that. So therefore more money would have ended up in the pockets of the owners, which as an investment would make it more attractive. But it would also have driven up the, the price, certainly uh, well beyond three billion. Um, you know, I, I, I occasionally talk to people who have got a vague interest in this and they say, the trouble with football is that so much of the money goes into uh, into the playing side of things that it, it doesn't it doesn't leave enough for the billionaire owners to make more money out of it themselves. So that they're a bit bit reluctant to spend the the, the prices which are being asked. Um, one of the sort of the, the 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 hopes that a lot of fans have, a lot of fans we've spoken to anyway, is that one day fan ownership at Manchester United could become a reality. I know there's been sort of a little bit of a discussion around that. I know that I think it was Joel Glazer met with some of the fans forum. I know the fans forum, it's something they've been pushing for. Do you ever think we'll be in a situation where fan ownership, even that if that's, you know, a small part of Manchester United could become a reality? Um, I, I think not in the way that most Manchester United fans would want. Uh, you know, in theory, United fans could go out and buy shares in New York today. You know, there's, there's nothing to stop them. Um, but I think when the uh, supporters trust did speak to Joel Glazer, the hope was that the, uh, the the United fan base would be able to buy those shares which carry ten votes each, or the the club would issue more shares exclusively to the fans, um, which would would which would actually raise more money uh, for Manchester United and give the the, the fans uh, a slightly bigger holding within the club but to me it made no sense what, what listening to him because you know they, they see united as a, as a cash cow that they've made they're, they're making a lot of money from it uh you know avram glazer he made you know 100 million earlier this year we've just got kevin and edward making a you know 130 to 140 million you know that's you know, that's a quarter of a billion pounds. They've still got control of the club. They could do a couple of things similar in future years. You, 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 you can't spend it all. You know, they've, they've made enough money out of Manchester United to never, never need to, to do anything again in their life. So, so from their point of view, why not keep milking it and, and keep, the, keep the fans at arm's length? Because the last thing they want is... You know, is, is somebody from from Urmston or Stretford giving it as it is? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, sad to hear that, but I, I can see where you're coming from completely. Um, just in terms of the the Newcastle takeover, I mean, for starters, just from a United point of view, there was talk that maybe the the, the Saudi family that bought Newcastle were, were interested in United. Um, that's obviously not going to happen. Do you think there isn't that there is a shortage of potential buyers for Manchester United? that could afford and want to, to buy the club? Or do you think a club like Manchester United, if someone wanted it, then there's always going to be people rich enough to buy it, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think somebody could could buy it. There, there, are, there are more billionaires around than we realise. If you think that, uh, that Daniel Leck, uh, the, the Spotify guy, he, in theory, is, is willing to pay £2 billion for Arsenal, and, and no disrespect to Arsenal, they're not Manchester United. So um, I don't see the price as being 
um, a, a deterrent. If somebody was was hugely wealthy and genuinely wanted to buy United, they, they just put in an offer to the Glazers, which was um, too good to turn down. Um, but the thing is, if I'm looking at Manchester United as an investment, I, I, I don't know where the growth is. Uh, you know, the, you, you can't extract more money out of the stadium. You know, it's it's as big as it realistically can go. Uh, the Glazers haven't invested in Old Trafford. They've not invested uh, the same amounts that we're seeing, uh, you know, at, at the likes of Spurs, who have got, uh, I, I don't know whether you've been to the new stadium, and I'm, I'm no way am I a Spurs fan, but it is, it is gobsmackingly good as a as a stadium uh, activity. Um, they're, they're struggling now to uh, get approval from UEFA to hold Champions League finals and, and similar because the the facilities at Old Trafford they're starting to look a bit old. So you know how how are they going to get more money from from the stadium itself? They've done well to get plenty of money from their commercial partners, but if you take a look at the numbers over the last five years. They flatlined. You know, they, uh, you know, uh, Ed Woodward was famously said Manchester United doesn't need to win football matches to be popular with sponsors. But what we've seen for the last five years, yes, they're popular, but sponsors have said, well, you know, whilst whilst you're not winning things, we'll pay you what we paid you historically, but we're not willing to pay more. So therefore, the only thing they've really got to do is is to try to get more money out of broadcasting. And, and again, that that's that's centrally agreed by UEFA um, and by the Premier League. And unless the rules change, unless United can start selling matches directly to the fans themselves, and this is where they've always felt that there is money, um, I, I just can't see where the growth is going to come. Just finally on the on the Newcastle front, um, obviously that's been a massive story. I know you've been talking about it quite a lot, and you know the, the money that's. The, the 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 group that own or the family that own Newcastle have is is ridiculous. Um, what do you think this means for the rest of the Premier League? Newcastle United having these owners having that money. Do you think it's going to change things at all? Do you think it's going to you know increase the sort of the amount of people are spending on transfers? Do you think it's going to change the sort of the look of the top four or anything like that? What do you think this could mean for the, for the rest of football? I think in the short term, I don't think the the big six, I don't think there is a big six at present. It's more of a big four. Um, I don't think they've got too much to worry about because if you take a look at what happened when Abramovich bought Chelsea and, uh, you know, Sheikh Mansour bought City, um, they could spend as much money as they want. And, and they did. Yeah, they just blew everybody else out of the water. And they, they signed some good players and they signed some turkeys. Um, and when they signed the turkeys... Uh, they were paid so much money, they didn't want to go elsewhere. So therefore, you were left with these players on huge wages. And all that uh, all that Chelsea and City went out is that if they signed a Duff centre forward like Joe, or um, they just went and signed out another one and, and let him you know, earn a fortune for four years. Now, with financial fair play, that comes back to, to bite you in the bum. So if we take a look at sort of the closest thing to, to uh, Newcastle in recent years is, uh, is Everton. You know, they are owned by um, Farhad Mashiri, um, and he's he's big buddies with uh, Alicia Usmanov, who is seriously wealthy. Um, but they spent a fortune in in the first three to four years. They spent they spent over a half a billion pounds on players, um, and when they turned out to be not as good as people thought they were, they again have got this problem with you know wages stuck on the wages stuck on the wage bill for a few years. But of course, after three years, financial fair play really kicks in. So unless Newcastle get it right every single time, and, and, and no club's ever done that in terms of the players they sign. And of course, that in, initially, they're going to have to offer wages which blow everybody else out the water because what, what has Newcastle got to offer? Because you know, at present, they're in a relegation spot. So if you were a fantastic footballer, what are you looking for? Yes, you're looking for money. But also, you're looking for participation in the Champions League. Newcastle can't offer you that. So therefore, you've got to go and offer them even more money. So that, And again, there's financial fair play implications. So short term, I think they, they will spend a lot by their standards. Longer term, they, they, they have to get into Europe to then to start to 
be able to offer money to the decent players and getting into the Champions League, if, if you get as far as the final and winning it, is, is worth you know, 100, 130 million a year. Um, and then they would become a, a serious threat on a longer term basis. But getting there is much harder than staying there. Yeah, it seems like they've got the work cut out, but I'm sure they'll throw a lot of money at the situation no matter what happens. Kieran, it's been great. Well, it's been great chatting to you, even though it has been a little bit <laughs> depressing in some <laughs> respects <laughs> because of the, the obvious stories and the obvious updates with, with what's happening with the Glazers. Um, it's what we all kind of guessed anyway, but it's good to have it explained for us as well. So I appreciate you coming on the channel and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, top man. Thanks. Thanks, Take Kieran. Care, baby. Take care. Bye-bye. So big thanks to Kieran Maguire, the financial expert there, for coming on and talking us through what was a bit of a downer, really, wasn't it, to be honest with you. It doesn't look like the Glazers are going anywhere anytime soon. But as always, we'll keep you updated on any developments on the ownership of Manchester United. Do get involved in the comments. Let us know what you think about what Kieran had to say. Don't forget as well, if you're not doing, to hit the subscribe button. Let's get to over... Well, let's get to 700,000 subscribers by the end of the season. I'm sure we can do it. So if you're not subscribing, hit subscribe. I've been Jay Martin. This has been the one-on-one -on -one interview. Thanks for watching.